Hi, uh, welcome to the School Zone, the podcast by the Oklahoma Public School Resource Center. Uh, today's episode is episode seven, and uh, it also falls on Valentine's Day. And our Valentine's Day guest is Representative Scott Fettgatter. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to spend my Valentine's Day with you, you know, instead of my is, wife. It's, it's been a dream of mine uh, to, to spend, spend, spend my Valentine's Day with you as well. <laughs> I'm sure it has. <laughs> I mean, what better way to spend it? Right? I, I really can't think of anything better. I, so. I agree. So, um, And today, uh, for those baseball fans out there, which I'm somewhat of a fanatic, today is also um, Pitchers and Catchers Report. That's my true, my true first love. <laughs> okay. All <laughs> so, right. Yes, my wife uh, is, uh, is, is unhappy because... Because that means that listening to baseball on radio is, is soon to come. So there you have it. Yeah, there it is. Well, so um, we're going to jump into um, in our interview today just to give a quick overview. And we're going to talk about uh, what it's like to grow up in Oak Mulgee, um, uh, because that's where you're from. And then I uh, wanted to talk about what it's like to be a legislature in the Oklahoma, uh, legislator in the Oklahoma legislature. Okay. And then we'll talk about uh, public schools and, uh, and and things that are going on at the Capitol. Fantastic. Cool. So I don't think I had a chance to tell you my background. And, no. But I was thinking about this. So I grew up in Flint, Michigan. Okay. And, uh, you know, now when I grew up, when I went to college, everyone talked about a, a, a film called Roger and Me mm-hmm. that a guy named Michael Moore put out. I'm sure you're a big fan. Yeah, um, huge fan. Yeah, yeah. Um, Roger and Me... I was not a huge fan of because it, it, it really made fun of growing up in Flint. Okay. And um, now everyone knows Flint for its great public water system. It's fantastic. Um, and, you know, I've gotten lots of jokes of, oh, now I understand why you act so weird. <laughs> um, but um, I wonder what, what was it like growing up in Oak Mulgee? And, and I don't, maybe, you know, I don't want to disparage Oak Mulgee at all. Just like I don't like to disparage sure. Flint. It was a great place growing up. But I think Oak Mulgee, I think it's fair to say, is known as sort of a tough town, a tough place to grow up. Did you have – because I grew up in Flint, and I remember I got to college, and I was like, wait a minute. Flint's a tough place? Like, you know, it was home for me. Right. Did you have a similar experience? No. You know, back when, when I was growing up, you know, I was born in 68. My family moved from uh, – I was born in Shawnee, and uh-huh. uh, we uh, moved to Old Mulgee in 1972. My father owned a, a grocery store there. Okay. And so we were in the grocery business till 1989. And um, Old Mulgee was – a great place to grow up. I mean, you know, it was a really, you know, kind of a hustle bustle community. At one time, Old Mulgee, you know, way before I was born, um, was actually, you know, a very wealthy community. A lot mm-hmm. of, a lot of uh, oil and gas, oil, so, oil money there. So it was oil money. Though. Yeah, it was oil money, and um, so, so a lot of big, nice homes and uh, great school systems, and um, it, you know, great athletics and. Just, mm-hmm. you know, all the things, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, shop owners and different things. But, but you know, a few years ago, I was in a meeting with uh, Dr. Pat from OSUIT. And um, he made a comment that really, really struck me pretty hard. He said, if you grew up in Old Mulkey and you're sitting in this room, you've known nothing but decline in our community since you're in your entire life. And when I thought about that, he was absolutely right. Mm-hmm. You know, as long as I can remember back, Old Mulgee, um, as well as many, many rural communities in our state, have been in a constant decline, you know, for since since I've been alive. Yeah, that is, that's <clears throat> similar. Flint was, was one of the, it's known as the birthplace of Buick and one of the birthplaces of General Motors. But yeah, since, I was born in 77, since my birth, factories have been closing, and and now I actually get lost in Flint because the factories not only are closed, they're actually gone. Yeah, they, they sold them for scrap. Yeah. Um. So, um, it's it is a really weird thing, and it's re- really weird to live in Oklahoma City now, and you see this growing and thriving city, and I kind of compare and contrast that. So, but at one time. If- if you recall, yeah. o- Oklahoma City was on, on that same trajectory down. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you drive down to Oklahoma City, and the buildings were empty, and it was you know, um, you know, a lot of you know drug problems and issues were going on downtown. But it took vision. Yeah. It, it you know, in, in the words of Governor Stead from the state of the state, it took reimagining. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma City for Oklahoma City to be able to pull themselves out. And, yep. it, you know, out of that problem. So let's go there. I want to get in more into your bio because I want folks to know who you are. But let's talk about that. So, like, because 
how do we do that for rural communities, mm-hmm. right? Because, I mean, it's not just Okmulgee. You're right. Like, lots of rural communities. Correct. And this isn't an Oklahoma problem either, right? No. I mean, no, I think this nationwide. is... Yeah, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on, like, what a rural community can do to, to do that kind of reimagining? So, you know, in the legislature, we all get in our lane, right? Whether it's sure. health care, education, or whatever it may be. My, my lane, I, you know, I, I would best define it as, you know... E- economic growth you know how do how do we how do we make you know government doesn't create jobs but we can help create an environment in our state where companies want to bring their business here entrepreneurs want to start a business here Mm -hmm. so I focus a lot on those efforts and sometimes you know it's difficult for um my constituents to maybe understand that that we all get in those lanes Mm -hmm. but that's kind of how it works in the legislature (coughs) excuse me and um so we have to reimagine Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And that can't be, let's reimagine Tulsa and Oklahoma City. That has to be, let's reimagine Muskogee, Oatmulgee. If you look at Durant, for example, I lived in Durant for several years. And if you go to Durant today, compared to when I was there 20 years ago, it's a completely different community. A lot of, lot of, a lot of industry has come in, you know, a lot of growth. Mm-hmm. Um, they were just recently selected um, for some Main Street challenge that's a nationwide. They're doing a that's television cool. show. Um, you got the Choctaw Nation. And, 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 and really what it took, it, it, it took the, the Choctaw Nation, it took the city officials and the county officials and all the leaders in those communities to come together, you know, the college, and, and say, what can we do to make our community get better? And we have to do that all across the state. And so we've we've had a real kind of a renaissance in Okmulgee okay. over the past four years where we have private investment through um, the historical tax credit, for example. They'll buy an old building, and they'll take it, and they'll restore the old building, and they, they, they receive some tax credits for doing that. But more importantly, once we did that, then OSUIT, they came in and they bought two buildings, and they moved dorms. So they restored oh, cool. two our our original old post office building. They restored those. We call it the GoPo. Um, they restored those buildings, put seventy four students, and they're you know one block from Main Street and our town square. So it's it, it's it's got to have you got to have some vision. Mm-hmm. And when when the 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 election was going on, all the you know gubernatorial candidates that reached out to me. That's what I told them. I said, look, because they were all talking about vision and. These things, and I said, you can't just have vision for you know Tulsa, and Oklahoma City. You got to have some vision for our rural communities because at the end of the day, until we bring our low wage earners back to a middle wage status through economic development, our rural communities, we can come up to Twenty Third and Lincoln every day, every every session of every year, and we can argue about who are we going to raise taxes on, or who taxes or whose agencies are getting cut. Yep. We have to we have to create more taxpayers in the state. State of Oklahoma, and when we get that ingrained in our brain matter, so we need to focus on industry that requires, you know, a large spread of land, for example, mm-hmm. you know, auto manufacturers, those types of things. You're talking yeah. about Michigan, yeah, you know, an auto manufacturer. Stop taking the auto jobs, dang it. Well, we need them here. Now, so, <laughs> but that's know, fine. I'm, I live here. Now. That's right. So, you know, you need a place that you know they need a few, maybe a couple hundred acres, even. Yeah, and that's how you can build rural Oklahoma. Focus mm-hmm. on high tech manufacturing, those types of jobs. Yeah, I, I I like that. The one other one other thought is, um, and a and a plug for the resource center at the same time is, um, I think I spent some time um, working in the IT field, and you know when you think of technology, you think of Silicon Valley. I think of you know some big cities, um, but technology coding can can happen anywhere. There's yeah, absolutely some studies. I think it was a story I heard about a town in Iowa that's completely re. Reimagined itself around um, computer science, which is yeah. a, you know, so there are jobs. I mean, I've done a lot of reading on sort of the new technology, and it gets a little scary, you know, when mm-hmm. we start automating a lot of stuff. But I think for rural communities, some of that stuff can, I think, could fit into what you're saying, sort of that reimagining. What Absolutely. We're, what we're I mean, you can take prior for a prime example. You know, you have Google up there, and you know their school systems. Yeah. Their school systems are. In thriving. very good shape financially. The community's thriving. You have a lot of jobs. And, you know, maybe we can focus some efforts on data processing centers. And maybe mm-hmm. we can pull in some other companies like that to, to our state. Cool. I want to come back to this when we talk about education mm-hmm. and the legislature. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. So you grew up in Oak Mulgee. 
you know, how'd you get to where you are today? So I'm the guy um, in the legislature that uh, I'm not an attorney or a doctor or have some, you know, high powered degree. I'm the guy that graduated high school and I didn't have an opportunity to go on to higher education. So what I do, I loaded up my buddies in a U-Haul van and we moved to California to be rock stars. Oh, that's so, awesome. So that's, that's who I am, you know, and I that's thought who I am inherently. When I met you, that was the first thought I had. I, I'm sure it was. I'm sure that that was exactly <laughs> what came out of your, you know, your, your mind, but so, so I look at things a little differently. Did you, at times. Were you in LA? We didn't go to LA. We went to the Bay Area. Oh, sweet. So, uh, so we played up and around there. But, you know, I look at things a little bit differently. Obviously, mm-hmm. I'm a conservative. And, um, you know, I, I look at things from a, a conservative point of view. Um, Forrest Bennett, however, which we talked about earlier, yep. yeah. Forrest and I had an argument on the floor last year, and we get along great. We give each other big hugs, you know. I mean, but he's like hugging a big bear, you know. He what I'm is. Saying? I mean, he makes us look like little guys. That, it, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So, so we had an argument on the floor last year, and I told him, I said, Forrest, I said, uh, I said, we're we're both standing over a number. I'm seeing a six. You're seeing a nine. And I said, but but neither one of us are wrong. We're just both seeing it from a different perspective. Uh-huh. So, so when you, when, you know, as far as who am I, you know, I'm a guy that I've worked hard my whole life. I came home from California. I got married a short time later um, to my wife who I went to high school with, which she, she thought I was crazy. And she's like, you know, she wouldn't have anything to do with me when we were in high school. But then we, <laughs> we got to, together afterwards. So I'm not we'll, sure she was completely wrong, right? Yeah, she's probably a little <laughs> bit right. But, but I think that's what makes life exciting for her, right? Yeah. So um, she's, uh, you know, we, we got married and um, we've been together 30 years nearly. And wow. um, have two, two grown kids, three grandbabies. Um, the so, rock star becomes so, a grandpa. So, so life is pretty good for me right now. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, we moved back to Omogi about four years ago. We had lived in Tulsa for a few years. Okay. And so uh, I owned a construction business um, since 2008. My background in the corporate world was in sales and marketing and uh, sales management. And um, I owned a construction company, and I got elected. And then we had a session, and then we had a special session, and then we had another special session, and then we had Company's another. Doing great, huh? And then we had another regular session, and then we had medical marijuana <laughs> yeah. for twelve weeks. So, so literally, since I was elected, I've spent most of my time um, in here Oklahoma in City. Oklahoma City. So, so I'm a I'm a full time legislator at this point. Wow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to the decision. How did the How do you decide? I want to I want to join this fraternity. Known as the Oklahoma Legislator. So I was I was doing a morning radio show with a buddy of mine locally in Old Morgan, oh, yeah. and um, I was standing outside on a on a break, and a guy across the street walked over, and we were talking. He said, "Hey, you know this this house seat's coming open." I had done a lot of things in the community, try to um, you know help you know re- regenerate people getting out of the house and and, and getting, getting together. So I threw put together a few events. And um, when his my first response to him when he said you ought to you ought to think about running it was that's well above my pay grade, you know because <laughs> I had this complex of you know I wasn't intelligent enough or I wasn't you know I wasn't the right guy I wasn't PC enough and all yeah. these things and and then I had another person ask me to consider it and then so when I had two or three people ask I thought you know maybe I ought to think about it and I prayed about it talked to my wife about it. Uh, incidentally, my father-in-law is a former senator, okay. uh, Roger Ballinger, okay. and um, I didn't even discuss it with him <laughs> because he, he was a Democrat, <laughs> okay, and so yeah. I didn't want I didn't want either a biased opinion of well you're a Republican I don't want you in there or you're my son-in-law and I don't want my daughter to have to go through that so sure yeah so uh, we we made the decision and. Um, we haven't looked back since. Cool. And so this is your second second term. Just starting my second term. Yes. Okay. Cool. So what's it been like? I mean, I know it's been your first term was not a normal first term. For Correct. Edward. Yeah. But going into it, what are things that sort of stand out? Like this is what I expected, and it was realized, and and vice versa. Like, what are some of the things you've sort of run into that you're like, well, I never would have expected this of the job. Yeah, um, I think that the part that I never would have expected was that most everybody that I serve with in in the legislature are really just good, 
Oklahoma people that have differences of opinions. Mm -hmm. And those opinions and those ideals are based on life experiences, you know, how they were raised, you know, where they were raised. And so, again, it goes back to they're not right or wrong necessarily. It's just we differ in opinions. But they're good, solid people who really want the best for our state for most of the part. We, we had Representative Nichols on, uh, Monroe Nichols from Tulsa, and, and he said the – the the individ the, the 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 product of the legislature is not representative of the individuals that that, that the individuals are much better than the, than the than the the, the, the sort of the product that sometimes you see out there. I would so agree with that statement. That was a good way of putting yeah. it. So, but that so that was the big unexpected part. I thought I was going to come up here with a bunch of people, you know, that uh, I wouldn't like at all. But uh -huh. but you know, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle they're on or or which chamber they're in. For the most part. I like everybody in there. I get along with everybody. There are a few people that, you know, sometimes I want to kick them around, but, you know, but, sure. but uh, that's just, you know, life in general. Um, as far as, you know, what's it been like, you know, I, I don't really have anything to compare it to. Sure. So the last two years is just the norm for me mm -hmm. at this point. So um, it's like my daughter was born prematurely and spent the first nine months in the hospital. And people are like, it's got to be, it's got to be awful. I'm like, I, I don't know. I get to see my kid every day. I, yeah. you know, I don't know any better. <laughs> yeah, I, that's exactly right. I hear stories, but yeah, uh, I'm yeah. not necessarily sure uh, what it what it should look like. Uh, but I would say, um, as far as what I expected to do versus what we did, um, I planned to come up here the first two years. Not say a whole lot. I really didn't file a, a, a bunch of bills, you know, or anything. I just wanted to come up and kind of learn. I felt like I was a little behind the learning curve anyway. Um, but, but when we got here and we were, you know, a few days in, I started to realize quickly that that was not going to be able – that wasn't going to work. We came in with a large class, which, you know – at the time was the second largest class, but now we have another yeah, large, much class, large class, which is right. even larger than ours. Yeah. So we came in, my class, we came in, and and we had to get into a fight um, in order to survive yeah. at that point because uh, it was rough. Now, within your your class yeah. spans parties, <clears throat> is there some... I mean, we're all familiar with the the Democrat Republican mm -hmm. split. Is there some split like where where you'll cross party lines because they're part of your class? Does any of that go on? You know, we we worked really hard our first two years, even in a bipartisan way, mm -hmm. to to stick together. Now, you could talk to either side, and you would get difference of differences of opinion. Um, but I have friends on both sides of the aisle. Colin yeah. Walkie is a great friend of mine. Um, Jason Dunnington, uh, as far as my class goes, you know, I I, I visit regularly or harass Matt Meredith regularly, um, and so I saw some of that harassment yesterday in committee. You, you, exactly, <laughs> you did, and um, and so I get along with all of them, and I just I just realize that we look at things differently at times. Yeah, I think I can appreciate that. Um. Let me see. I, I, I'm dying to get into the education. Let's just jump there. We'll, we'll jump back. Right. So so before we jump into work at the legislature, when we met last week and we, we, we talked a little bit, you were telling me about a program on Mulgee. Can you tell me about that? And and uh, sort of, you know, so, you know it, and, and I should give a plug to Superintendent Ren, Renee Dove, mm -hmm. the superintendent there in Oak Mulgee. Um, the, the Oak Mulgee is a member of the Resource Center, so we're, we're proud to work with them. Good. But Good. yeah. Yeah, so um, Omoe has the ACE program, and the ACE program is a learn at your own pace program. Mm -hmm. And um, I haven't had the opportunity to really dive in and understand, you know, um, the, the, the effects it's really having other than what I can just visually see, conversations that I have. But it was interesting, a few months back, I brought Superintendent Hoffmeister to Old Mulgee and a couple of my other schools in the district. And the one thing that, I've no that I noticed that stuck out like a sore thumb was we would go into a traditional classroom where mm -hmm. the teacher and the children were, or the, or the students, and um, they were a little introverted didn't have a whole lot to say, not a lot of interaction. When the introductions were made, there wasn't much expression. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a little bit 
uh, cold and a little, little standoffish, right? Mm -hmm. Then when we went over to the ACE program, we would walk into a classroom full of students, and they wanted to say hi. They would come up, shake your hand, introduce themselves, and they would engage you in conversation. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I saw that, I had been through the program before and seen some, some change, but when I saw that, it just was shocking to me because one of the things that we lack in our workforce today and uh, I used to train this as a sales trainer all the time. You know, when when a child is growing up, we beat all the things out of them that they need when they become an adult. How to be independent, <laughs> yeah. you know, how to voice your yourself and how to assert yourself. And so we beat that out of them in the submission, which I'm not saying don't don't discipline your children, but sure. but do, you know, my point is we're lacking that in those soft skills, you know, so today in the, in the, why do you workforce. think, cause the, the ACE program is a personalized <clears throat> learning program. <clears throat> why do you think the ACE program gets a different, or at least the, the students behave differently? Why do you think that is? I think you're putting more responsibility on them mm -hmm. to be responsible to themselves and accountable to themselves. I think your teachers uh, are engaging them differently. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so much a here, you know, I'm standing up here and here's how I'm, yeah, it's here's, not the, here's, sage here's the, the stage. math problem. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I think just the interaction is so much different yeah. that, um, it's producing results. And we do have students that are, gra that, that pro potentially would not have graduated high school yep. that are now graduating early. They're in concurrent enrollment. Yeah. They're coming out of school with with uh, college credits or credits towards a certificate, whether it be, you know, some sort of career path. So when I went through this process, I, I, I kind of clicked in my mind. I was like, okay, I'm I'm seeing we, we may need to look at high school, and how high school operates at this point, and we need to we need to, you know, there are going to be students that are going to be academic students and there are going to be students that are going to be on a career path and you don't choose for them you let them choose themselves but exposing them mm -hmm. to the opportunities available to them i think is critical um for the future of our state yeah i, I agree um you're reminding me so i should note you're not a paid um, advertiser for uh, for no. personalized learning the resource center is really supportive we, we work with a number of schools including oak mulgee on, on this personalized learning work, we work with a consultant named Ken Grover out of Salt Lake City who, who helped Salt Lake City Public Schools implement a model. Um, we've got, uh, I don't know the exact number, around 20 different models that we're, we're trying to help support. <laughs> but one of the things you, you reminded me is I saw Sal Khan. Are you familiar with Khan Academy? Uh -uh. So Khan Academy, Sal Khan is East Indian. Mm -hmm. He's a huge family. And okay. he started tutoring online one of his, um, I think it was one of his nieces in math. Mm -hmm. And he built a website for putting up math problems like on videos. Mm -hmm. And that's now turned into the Khan Academy. It's oh, okay. a free resource for math. And so he's he's kind of a visionary <coughs> person. Um, I don't, I mean, it's mostly Khan Academy, still mostly math focused. It's I like it. I've, I've worked with my daughters with it a little bit. Um, but I saw him speak and he got up and he said, I want to, I want you to stop and think about our educational model. And he said, I'm gonna, I want you to think about how we use time. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to argue that time is the factor that shapes our entire existing model, the, the model that you and I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, I want to challenge that, that notion of time. So he said, what I mean is if you have a textbook, you can spend so much time on chapter one because mm -hmm. you have to get through the entire textbook in, in the year. And so if time's the, the factor that we don't allow to flex, well, then what do we flex? Well, we flex things like competency or, or content understanding. And that's why we have a grading system, because mm -hmm. it's okay to get a 75% on this because we can't slow down time. We have, we have to keep on marching forward gotcha. in time. Yeah. So if we say, actually, what if we don't care about time? What if we don't care how long it takes <laughs> someone to master a concept? What if we said... Content mastery is the most important thing, mm -hmm. and we're going to let the children that understand a concept to move forward, and those that need more time to take that more time. Well, that that changes everything, right? It right. Changes, then it then we question why we have grading scales, right? Because 
we don't really care how long it takes. We want you to understand the materials. It, right. It changes what a classroom looks like. And it, you mentioned it changes the role of a teacher, right? Mm-hmm. From that sort of imparter of knowledge to now that facilitator of learning. Right. So I don't know if there's a question there, but you got me, you got me off on a tangent about it. What, what, what's interesting what? though is when I, and I haven't been to Okmulgee, it's on my list. You challenge me to you get out there and I will. I, so I've been to Okmulgee. I haven't been to the ACE program. Um, but so I need to get there. But when I've gone into other personalized learning schools, yeah, the, you remember we sat through the classes, right, where the teacher was just droning on, and you know you're either lost or bored or both. And like in a personalized learning world, like you're getting material right on your level, and you know that it's you know it's like it's your job to get that done, right? right. It's just that that transfer of responsibility from the teacher's responsible to the kids' responsible. Right. I don't know. It's, so it there sounds was a, like so. So it's interesting because there there was a period of time where, for about six years, I was in ministry, and um, it was during a time when um, the church uh, began a change. Okay. Okay. We were changing music Which at this church? point. Oh, okay. So we were going from hymnals. Uh-huh. To more praise and worship, more contemporary style of music, um, and and so one of the things I had to do as a leader is I had to work with the congregations and and and, and people to get them to understand that the message had never changed over time. Mm-hmm. However, the method in which the message is delivered has constantly changed. Mm-hmm. Over time, so the hard thing for us is we we are creatures of habit. We don't like change. We're yep. resistant to change, and when you talk about change with people, if you're not a part of what they do, they begin to question the validity of you having the conversation at all with them. And so, sometimes it's good though for somebody to from the outside to look into my world and say, "Hey, you know what? This is what I see from my perspective." And sometimes that can cause that light bulb moment for you to to say, okay, I need to embrace this type of change. I think that's where we are. We're at as a state. I think that's where we are as a country right now. It's time for us to say, you know, things are not the same as the they world were has changed 35, 40 years ago. 10 years ago. <clears throat> exactly. And technology is moving at a, such a rapid pace. So... We have to figure out how do we get Oklahomans to embrace change. Yeah. And 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 if we can do that, then we can be better than a top ten state. We can be anything we yeah. want to be. Can we talk about that just <clears throat> somewhat of a ridiculous aside, but I'm done with the top ten thing. Like if we talked about like how do we get OU to a top ten football program, everyone would say, Why aren't we top one? Right? Like yeah. so let's take that mentality. Yeah. I don't know. That's I I I like to use sports analogies sure. to challenge no, people. Sure, no, it's fine. So, yeah. you know, I, 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 I agree. It's you know, we we got a ways to go probably to get to top ten, but you know what? But like, if we can just take it, you know, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Yep. You know, if we can just if we can just get in the top ten of something, that's true. That's positive, and one move at a time, that that sometimes will create a large chain reaction mm-hmm. that starts to move other uh, links, if you will. So talk about that. What are things that we can do to make the state more? I love talking about change. I talk about it forever. I was a, at one point a change management consultant. I'm okay. not exactly sure there what that go. means, but it was a good title. It's right? a great title. I, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, maybe I should take on that yeah, title. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll loan it to you. <laughs> so, um, uh, what are some thoughts on like like how do we make that change more comfortable or where people are more accepting of it? So you know, it's interesting coming from you know my background. And, and lack of experience in the political world to then entering the political world from the inside now looking out. Mm-hmm. In in general, Oklahomans, it seems like we just aren't very happy with our state, and and there's 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 justification behind it, but until we can get to a place to where we are proud again mm-hmm. of who we are in this big world that we live in. Yeah. And we can start talking about positive things and we can stop fighting each other. You know, one group needs something, so they try to drag another group down while they're getting it. And those types of conversations yeah. that play out in the national media. Yeah. Until we can get to that place, um, we're going to struggle. 
But I think you're right about the, just the mentality, right? Because mm-hmm. I moved here five and a half years ago, chose to move here. Moved here from mm-hmm. Washington, D.C., didn't have any roots at all. My wife's from Pennsylvania. I'm from Michigan. We met in New Orleans. We have a little weird background. Gotcha. Um, but, you know, you come, and I'll speak about the cities first, but then I'll talk about rural Oklahoma. You come to, you know, when we first <coughs> visited Oklahoma City and then Tulsa, we said, well, these are two mid-sized cities in the United States. Quality of life is ridiculously high. I mean, I have a house for half the price that's nicer than my house in D.C., closer, better commute. Mm-hmm. Um, I know my neighbors. We like each other. We talk right. to, you know. Right. I mean, you say hi. And yeah, yeah. You know, have a I good mean, day. No yeah, fun. yeah. You come downtown. There's fun restaurants. There's things to do. You know, I actually called somebody yesterday. I was stuck in traffic for two minutes yesterday. Two, two minutes. minutes. I was incensed. That's and then I started game. to laugh at myself, you know. I get upset you know? at Omoge if I have to sit there more than 30 <laughs> I'm seconds. I'm sure. I'm sure. But I mean, like. It is. I mean, the cities are great places, and then I get to go out to all these different rural communities. I haven't asked what's the best restaurant in Okmulgee. It's mm-hmm. one of my favorite things to do because I love going into the little small towns and finding the – and then, yeah, you hear these negative things, and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, wh- wh- what are you talking about? Yeah. I like this place. So, yeah, yeah it's a little different. Well, I don't it, like the weather. The weather, mostly I want to I want to go crazy with. But other than You don't that, like the weather in Oklahoma? Well, I mean, sometimes I do, and well, then it changes it, it 15 changes minutes changes in later. a few minutes. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. So. Yeah, you know, it was interesting. The other night I was driving home, and um, uh, I was driving home from Tulsa, and we're about 30 miles south. Yeah. And, and it was dark. It was nighttime. And, I mean, I was looking at the the traffic ahead of me, yep. and it was a solid line of cars in both directions, heading north and south uh-huh. from Tulsa to Old Mulgee. I was so frustrated, both lanes. And it wasn't 5 o'clock rush hour. I mean, it was like 7, 8 o'clock at night. Huh. And so when, when I saw that, I thought to myself, you know what? Oklahoma's sitting on a lot of opportunity with all this traffic. Yeah, driving up and down our highways, and and if you stop and you think about just being at, in the midsection of the United States, yep. and how many people travel through our state, mm-hmm. um, we're we're positioned well. We just got to figure out how to start working together. In the political climate, you were talking about D.C. and the political climate as unstable as it is in Washington D.C. Yep, maybe in Oklahoma we can figure out a way to to work better together. And be a little nicer to each other, mm-hmm. and and maybe we can set a new standard that could create change for our entire country politically. I would take that. What's it been like with the new governor so far? <laughs> so, um, you know, I he 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 gave the state of the state. I haven't had a lot of interaction with him okay. at this point. Now, in the campaign, I had quite a bit of interaction with him. Just because Governor Stitt, when he decided to run, he was calling around the legislators. Mm-hmm. And and I know that he is still going around. He just hasn't got to me yet. I mean, he and I probably talked enough. He knows where I'm at on issues. Yep. Um, but uh, he is going around, and he's learning who the, the legislators are. Yep. He's learning how we think. He's, he's, he's uh, going around and visiting the agencies. I heard a story the other day of an agency that he went and visited, and a lady began to cry. Yeah, when he walked in, yeah. because he she had worked there twenty five years or something, and and had never met the governor. Yeah. So from that part of it, um, you know, I think it's pretty nice. I think uh, the the House and the Senate and you know the uh, administration are communicating. Yeah. Well, at this point, we'll see yeah. how long that lasts. We'll take that. <laughs> we'll see how long that lasts till the upper chamber messes with us. I'm uh-huh. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> But, you uh, listening, Greg Treat? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You are the upper chamber. You no, know. there you go. But uh, but things seem to be moving in a good path right now. I just another quick anecdote about Governor Stitt. I heard he met. I think it was outside the building. Just happenstance to meet a couple of women that work as legislative aides. Uh huh. He said, "Oh, we're coworkers." <laughs> He does. He That's, said. I, I, I heard him on video a, say that. Yeah. Hey, I'm your new coworker. I thought that was a really cool way. Now the uh, the aide that related it to me kind of rolled her eyes a bit. Like, yeah, we're slightly different, but you know what? I like that tone. I think that's kind of neat. I think I think that's what makes people successful when 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 leaders can realize that they're no better than anybody else. 
Mm-hmm. They're just, they just got a job to do, and they've been elevated to a specific position because of you know, some accomplishments they've had in their lives. But when I realize you know, I can come to Oklahoma City and everybody gives me all this attention and representative this. You, you are so you special walk, representative. Oh, yeah, you walk yeah. through the Capitol and everybody knows who you are and, uh-huh. and you, you're looking at a lot of them saying, man, I, I know I met you, but I can't remember your name. <laughs> but then you go back home and I'm just Scott. Yep. You know, I'm not Representative Fakehead at home. I'm just Scott. I grew up here. You know, same people like me, like me when I was a kid, and people that don't, didn't, you know, I'm, I mean, yep. it's just home. And so as long as, you know, leaders can remember where they came from yeah. and remember that they're no better than anybody else, then um, you, can, you can lead people on a good path. And I think that that image that you're talking about of Governor Stead is what's going to help. Cool. So let's switch. We, we, we've been dancing around education a little bit. So, you know, this is the first year I've lived here five years, and mm-hmm. this first year we actually have some money. Not yeah. a huge pile of cash, sure. but we have some. We're not talking about cuts on the first, second, sure. second week of session, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so what do you think, you know, the, the governor announced he wants to see a, a teacher pay raise during his state right. of the state. I know that a bill passed yesterday mm-hmm. to that effect, title off, which means mm-hmm. it's still got to go to conference. we still got to find the money. But what do you think, well, you can talk about that, or, or just in general, what do you think this session's going to do for education? What, what, how's it going to relate to public education? Well, I know there's some frustration uh, with educators right now because they're feeling like they hadn't been heard, right? Because mm-hmm. they, they, we gave them the, the raise, and then we had the walkout in which the, the message was we need more classroom funding. Mm-hmm. And I think if I could get any message out, it would probably be this. I think we all realize we need more funding in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But when you look at this from a a problem-solving chair, you have to look and say, until we get our teachers in a place where we can recruit them back Mm -hmm. from Texas or Arkansas or Missouri or wherever or anywhere around the country, until we get that compensation piece right, it makes it real challenging to lower class sizes because that means now you're having to add more teachers. Yep. And where so where do you get those people? That right. where do you get those teachers? So I think the legislature took a very positive step last year and and I think if educators can look and say, okay, that was nice. Let's see what they're doing. And now they see us continue to pick that up early in session this year and we're continuing to work down that path. Um, if we can regain that trust, because we've lost the trust as a, as a body, as a legislature. Yeah. If we can regain that, then I think, I think where we go is we get, we continue to work on compensation, uh, benefits and the whole, you know, the whole package. I think, uh, at, at some point we see a large drop into the classroom mm-hmm. when we get to a point to where we can get our teachers back. But I got to be honest with you. Right now, when I go out on social media and I look at um, educators' pages, um, you know, groups, yeah, um, they're not happy still. Which groups do you go to? You know, I uh, the uh, time is now. Okay, um, I, I, I I peruse that group pretty often. Is that the one? And then the other one that is Alberto's group. Or? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the one I the one I visit most is probably uh, Oklahoma. Parents and educators, Angel Clark Little, uh-huh. um, and uh, so I, 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 I watch those two sites pretty regularly. Okay, and then I just watch news stories that come out. Yeah, and I, and and a lot of times I won't even I know what's going on in the story, and I probably got it wrong anyway, right? So, <laughs> so I don't even read the story. You know, uh-huh. Oklahoma legislature does this, and I'm, yeah, I just go read the comments. Uh-huh. And what I see is I see that our educators and parents and stakeholders still aren't happy. Yeah. So until we can get that turned around to where teachers are proud to be teachers yep. and, and, and we as a body of legislators can show teachers the professional respect they deserve yep. and get their compensation to a place and get, you know, just just move the needle enough yeah. that we can start to get people to start talking bad about being a teacher in Oklahoma – and say, man, it's the greatest place in the world. That would be nice. Then we can start 
uh, recruiting teachers back. Maybe a loaded question, but do you think the anger is valid, useful? I mean, what do you, when you see that anger, what's your reaction to it? So my reaction is this. Teachers and educators and parents and Oklahomans in general, we look at the national politics, yep. and we think that Oklahoma politics is the same. Mm -hmm. For example, we think it, at the state legislature, all we have are a bunch of career politicians that are bought out by whatever lobbying side. Yep. You know, um, the reality is this. Almost 80% of the legislature right now has two years or less in government, <laughs> very far from, from career politician. Sure. If you look at the legislators that have been in, you know, for that short period of time, and then maybe four or six, you know, Speaker McCall, he's going into his seventh year. Um, he's an old grandpa at this he, point. He is, he is an elder in, in uh, the legislature. But um, if you look at that and you say, okay, well, let's separate that from our frustration because the, the frustration, to your point, is valid. Yep. No doubt. We've disrespected teachers and educators. We've, we've disrespected our children. We've disrespected the, you know, the administration. We've disrespected the entire uh, public education system. Um, so they have a reason to be frustrated. But if you were able to separate yourself for just a moment from that frustration and say, what's happened in the last, say, four years, I think you might be able to get a perspective that maybe things have changed and I've just not been able to, uh, I've been so upset uh, that I haven't seen that change. Yeah, yeah. It reminds <clears throat> me of, I saw Senator Langford speak to a group of students mm -hmm. and someone asked him about President Trump. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the the, you know, the student said something like, "Do you think President Trump's a good person?" Something along those lines. And um, I was really impressed by Senator Langford's answer. He said, "He said I actually do." He said, "I do think." And he said, "I'll, I'll, I'll preface this with, I disagreed vehemently with President Obama, but I actually think President Obama was a very good person as mm -hmm. well." He said, "I think." That, that both President Obama and President Trump do mean well. Um, and he said, and I, but I don't mind saying this. He said, I've said this publicly, but I've also said it directly to President Trump. I don't like how he talks. I don't like how he reacts to people, and I certainly don't like how he behaves on social media. Sure. Um, but then he stopped and he said, but you know what? He's a president, so he should know better. But the flip side is, he doesn't behave any differently than most other people do on social media. And he said, what really shocks me is, you know, he said, I can, anytime I tweet anything, I can go and I can find a nasty comment. Just, this oh, is the nature of being a U.S. Many. senator. Yeah, I'm sure you have the same experience. People just ignore mine. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, they're really ignoring mine, too. They just want to go in there and say something. Yeah. And he said, you know, what's really amazing is when someone says something nasty and mean to me, you know, he said, the most thought that I'll devote to it is is thinking it's so sad that you're that angry, you know, that your heart is that angry that, that, that you'll make these comments. But he said, I've never once taken sort of these vicious comments back to me and thought, oh, let me change my mind because this person said Not that, once. you know? And, you know, what's funny is I think people make those comments because I do think they want to change the mind, but, like, they somehow let that anger completely blind it. I don't know. I've often uh, seen, you know, good friends, childhood friends. Of course, we interact differently than my constituents and I do sure. on social media. And I'll see, uh, you know, old high school friends get in arguments on Facebook. And I sometimes I'll just sit there and shake my head. And I'll, every now and then, about I only respond about 5% of the time to that type of activity now. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'll go on there and say, I'm sure you've changed everybody's mind. <laughs> Through your Facebook debate. Yeah. And then it kind of becomes emoji smiley face and, you know, those kind of things at yeah. that point. Yeah, so, yeah. so I think you're right. I mean, people are just frustrated all across yeah. the country. We've It's um, so easy to be angry and just to let it go on social media. And I don't think you, people start to really think about the impact they make with that. I don't think they are right now. Yeah, yeah. And really... Um, the impact is very negative. You're not changing yeah. minds and hearts. Uh, uh You're 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 causing more division. 
I think so. Yeah. It's, so sometimes I'll just avoid it because I don't. I don't like that that feeling. I, I I'm not going to react to it. I'm not yeah. going to get in a fight. But I don't even like how I'll leave. You know, I'll be on Facebook for ten minutes and I'll see some some of that anger and and I. It just bugs me, you know. Yeah, I Even though I think some of the anger is valid, just like we talked about. So well, and because the way technology works now, <clears throat> you know, you can go to a movie, and when you come out, the, the, something will pop up, pop up on your phone with geofencing saying, "Hey, rate the movie" or something. You uh-huh. know, they, you know, technology is so advanced; it knows what you like or what it's you're an, looking at and invasive. what you see, and so it's very invasive. So. I have gotten to a point now where I, I pull up my Facebook feed and all I see is the ranting. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. You know, but that's what you're all, looking at. Yeah. All I see is the political stuff. And every now and then I just think, you know what? I just want to see you know, puppies my, and rainbows. Yeah, my, or... my friend taking their kids to a ball game or something. Yep. And uh, it, it, gets, it, it becomes exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts? What do you think we're headed? This legislative session, you think there's going to be other things? So you think t- teacher pay raise is going to happen this year? Mm-hmm. Anything else? Well, I think I think that there'll be more funding go to education to the classroom. What does that look like at this point? I'm not sure. Yeah. I, you know, I'm the chairman of finance in the house, and so I had a few bills that came through that members wanted her, but um, I deferred. Um, knowing that those are probably conversations that may come up in the budget negotiation During, process. Yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, I I think it's all going to really depend here in a couple of weeks when the board equalization comes out and they actually certify that number. Yeah. Now, um, we're still seeing, you know, positive growth. Um, and so we're hoping that that number is as close to $600 million, that $612 million Numbers was, possible. It was forecasting, and before. we have some bills we have to pay out of that, and some rainy day fund money we got to get back, and yeah, and we're going to see where we're at. But right now, as as soon as they came out with that six hundred twelve million dollar number, we had three billion dollars worth of requests. I'm sure. And so the piggy bank's just not that big. Yeah. So we're going to have to make some tough decisions on, you know, where is that money going to go, and where where do we get the most value in services, core services, um, for, for, for the amount of money we have. Cool. There'll be a lot of fights over where that money goes. Definitely. I'm sure. Yesterday I, w- I mentioned I was in committee. I was there for a specific <coughs> bill, house bill 2621. Mm-hmm. Um, something that I think is a good idea. Um, mm-hmm. but it's not a real popular idea, especially with, 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 uh, some public educators, which is a little odd being at the public school resource right. center supporting that. You voted in favor. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, you know, floor leader Eccles, he he took the title off of that bill, which what that basically yeah. means is he still it's a work in progress. He he wanted to get it, you know, out through a committee, um, and uh, he's still negotiating. You know where we can go with that. I think you're going to have to make a few changes on it. Um, I think the cap may be a little high for the taste of a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, some change in the population requirements, some change in the income. And just uh, so folks know, because we're we're inside nerds on this. The I got that. Twenty six, right. twenty six, twenty one is a bill. It's I think it's actually titled the Equal Opportunity Scholarship Act. So that connotes, and it does. Part of it is related to, to private schools. Folks can make a donation. They get a tax credit for their donation, and that donation goes to private schools for to offset tuition costs. And but then on the other side, and this is the side that the resource center is focused on, is folks can make a donation to an, what's called an EIGO, an Education Improving Granting Organization, and then those dollars can go to to public schools. And and we are an EIGO, or we have an EIGO nonprofit that that we manage and we work with. Our members to fundraise through that. And right now we've we're bumping up to the cap on the tax credit, so we're the bill is, is asking to move it up. Mm-hmm. It's right now I think thirty million. For, so right now it's five million dollars, and it would raise to thirty million both of those tax credits to the to the private schools as well as to the public schools. Right. I imagine that number is going to come down. Um, yeah, I would think. I think. Yeah, I think high. in order to get support, I think. I think what's real important for you know your your organization. Is you know public school teachers and administrators feel like this is a voucher system? Yeah, and it seems to me like it's far from that. I think it's an opportunity yeah. um, for public education or private education um, to you know tap into it and and uh, yeah you know do some things that they're not used to doing. But I think it's just a matter of educating. 
Yeah. Um, the public on what it is this actually is. I think is especially doing. on the public school side, because what the intent of the legislation is to encourage donations to then spur innovation, to support programs like the ACE program. Correct. Like Mulgee. So folks that hear this and say, gosh, I want to support that program, well, you know, you can reach us, and, and then we'll help you support that program in Elk Mulgee or, or similar programs across the state. I think so. one of the questions I had that maybe you can answer is, Great. Um, are you able to designate or, or is it going yes. to a pool? Or yes. So, so I mean, we have gotten a few donations. They just said we want you to invest it appropriately, mm-hmm. and ideally, everyone would do that because that'd, that'd make my job a heck of a lot more fun. <clears throat> I'd be like Santa walking around. But sure. most donors, you know, they want to support their local community or they want to support their alma mater. Um, and uh, so we've gotten you know some donations like that. And yeah, they can um, uh, they can earmark dollars um, to a sp- to particular school. Within the law, they really can't say, I want it to go to this program. The flip side is the school wants to work with the donor, as do we. So we want to make sure that the donor knows where their dollars are going. Once we get the dollars, we form a grant with the a grant document with the, um, with the school. Um, 100% of the dollars go to the school, and um, we just want to make sure that the, that the, you know, the dollars are spent on the program that it's designated for. And usually before the dollars come to us, there's already been a discussion over what are you going to use these monies right. for. So. so I think what you're saying is that, that you can designate it to a school, you just can't designate it to an earmark or to a specific to a sp- program. Correct. But if you had a conversation with the school said, hey, I'd really like to support the ACE program, yep. then it's in their best interest yep. to to honor that. Correct. Um, and, and so I think that's the big thing that I see is there's just – a lack of understanding of how this this scholarship works, mm-hmm. and um, without it's, some so, modifications, this, I, use, I don't know that I will support it on the floor. Okay. And so we need it. We need to make some. We need to, and we got to get some support behind it. Yep, I agree. And and it's not a scholarship on our side. There's a scholarships for the private schools. This is an innovation. Um, grant, right, right, right. We need a better word. We there is a better. A be- there needs yeah. to be a better word. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. That's that's. We, you're right. We've got to get more people to understand this. See, I just put him on the spot here, and I said, I don't know that I can support this on the floor. On this. <laughs> and I saw, look I saw that. the look. Look so. at that. No, don't worry. As soon as we're done here, we're going to tie him down and beat him with a rubber hose. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I just need, I just need my people in House District 16 to understand exactly what we're doing. Exactly. And if we do that. They can get behind it, and they can get behind me, and I can do, you know, the right thing, mm-hmm. and and I'm going to do the right thing anyway. Anyway, doesn't matter what happens and what repercussions I have to deal with. Sometimes I have to do You're something. You're not afraid of tough votes. Sometimes I'm not. I've made a few. Good. I've made a few tough votes. I think last year was a provided a plethora of opportunities for tough. If votes. If I were going to shy away for a vote from a vote, I would have already done it at this point. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, but I, but but yeah, I did support the bill in the committee, um, and uh, looking forward to working with the floor leader, you know, as well as you know other legislators and you all to see how how can we get this right where. We can educate the population in the state and and get it right so that we can get the support. Cool. We're nearing the end of, end of our time. I always like to ask: Is there anything else you want to talk about? Anything you're working on in particular? Anything you think we should have asked? No, I think you know. You asked, you know, where we're headed with education, and of course, I'm not. I'm not in the conversation at that level at this point. You know, sure. Um, being a second term legislator. But I, I think I think the future is bright. I, I'm hoping that uh, educators can um, you know, work with people like myself. Um, I don't think a lot of people understand. A lot of educators worked against us in our campaign. Yeah, which made it a little bit of a challenge. Um, it's a little I, hard. Here, come support me, and then I'm going to come attack you later, huh? It was. It, I was going to do the right thing no matter what. Yeah. I kind of got to a place, though, where it was like, okay, I just have to go do what I think is best. Mm-hmm. And whether educators support me or not is irrelevant. You know, if I'm a one-term representative, I could go home and be proud of that one term. Mm-hmm. That's the way I looked at it. Um, and so I think with some legislators, there's got to be a little bit of time of healing between the educators and the, and the legislators. And I think that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. So I want to encourage teachers and educators to reach out to their representatives and their senators yep. and, and try to have a you know a calm conversation about, okay, where do we go from here? Because that's kind of where we're at. Mm-hmm. Um, is it, okay, well, 
you know, I just would drive around. I'd see the remember in November signs. And, you know, mm -hmm. I saw what I saw what you said about me on social media and I saw all these things. And so kind of we're at that place now where it's like, where do we go from here? You know, how can we communicate better so that we're not constantly fighting each other and I'm fighting for you, um, but we can work together and I'm fighting for you because it makes for just a much better um, time for all of us. Reminds me of one of the favorite cards. One of my friends and I had been in a fight for a long time and she sent me a card that had these old tattered boxing gloves on the front. You opened up the card and it said at the top, "Are we fighting?" <laughs> yeah. And then below it said, "Am I winning?" <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 I thought it was a pretty good card. Yeah, it's so. a great card, and yeah, you know, I just want to encourage um, you know the the people who are watching or listening, uh, maybe driving down the road listening. You know, Oklahoma needs to move in a positive direction. There's a lot of positive things for us to talk about in the media. You know time that we're in mm -hmm. uh, we got we don't have a budget fall this year shortfall this year yep. we're already talking about education funding and what we're going to do we have a new new administration we got a great new lieutenant governor he's got a great vision for what he Matt wants Pinnell to do is exciting isn't it? he's he's very exciting um and and at the end of the day you have a great legislature you have a lot of great people up there that are no different than you and I, or, mm. well, I'm one of them, but... I hope uh, they're better than me. <laughs> well, I mean, but, you know, we're just we're just normal people trying, trying to, to do, do the right job. thing. And so we have a lot of things to be positive about. So, you know, reach out to your legislators and and see, see what we can do to work together. We're cool. not always going to agree. That's okay. I agree. Final question. Where do I go for lunch in Oak Mulgee after I go see the ACE program? That's tough. Yep. It's a real tough call. Give me because, a couple options. So, so we have Tavern 56. Okay. We have the Mexican Place. We have Kirby's. We have Boomerang. I mean, okay. we uh, we have, and good then options. we have, we have the, uh, you know, the standard, you know, fast food. We have Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen, Dairy Queen in Old Mogi is like an icon. Really? I mean, it's an original, you know, like an original okay. Dairy Queen. Where you can, you know, I love to go in there and get the chili cheeseburger. Okay. And uh, you don't go with the foot long. I usually I, go foot long. No, I, I, I don't do clean. the foot long off. Okay. My dad's okay. grocery store was right next to it for many years, and okay. so I kind of grew up on Dairy Queen. <laughs> but uh, Omogi's a great place and a lot to offer, and 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 really seeing a lot of great things go on there. Your passion for both Oak Mulgee and serving the legislature is really contagious. I appreciate you know, it. My whole district is really great. A lot, yeah. lot of positive things. You know, you look at, you know, I started down in Henrietta. You know, they have a great STEM program down there that they've just they recently do. started Yeah, new up. STEM center there. Fantastic. Yeah. They're seeing some growth with the highway intersection there. Mm -hmm. You know, you go over to Morris. You've all, Morris has always been a that is great a fun education town, community. It? Yeah. Great yeah. education community, great teachers, um, and great people. And then, you know, we, we, I go up into high school, and that's an area where it's kind of been great for me. It's, you know, it's great – you know, ranching community, agriculture community. And so I'm starting to get a lot, know a lot of people. I go up into Coweta, I go up into Broken Arrow. So I oh. have a, you know, Boynton is in my district. And, okay. And, uh, the, you know, I've had to help Boynton with some issues. I mean, so I have a great district and, and I'm proud to serve all of them. That's fantastic. Well, thanks for coming in. Just a, a quick uh, teaser for next week. We're going to have State Representative Rhonda Baker in, Chairwoman uh, Baker of the the Education Committee. So we're going to I'm going to really prepare some tough questions for her. She came um, in with me. Yep. Yeah. No, that's yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. in her she's in her second term as well. So excited to have her thoughts. Uh, just a reminder: if you go and you can you can rate us on that iTunes thingy. Um, you know, of course, you want to give us the five stars because it's so enjoyable to listen. If you've listened this long, you. You are truly a fan of the show. So, uh, but we appreciate you coming in, Representative Fett Gatter. Glad to have you. And, uh, and, and thanks for listening. All right. Thank you.